So good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I think I have some been invited because I, we have some challenges that we are interested in finding help with, and we'd like to uh, get you involved in, in our science. Um, as Dan said, I'm working for Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, most of you will probably ne never have heard of the uh, national labs. Uh, the Department of Energy operates 17 uh, laboratories uh, within the US. Um, they are responsible next to the universities for fundamental research in energy sciences, which spans quite a, quite a long way. It goes from uh, batteries, uh, new materials, to biology and uh, plants and things like that. Um, each of those labs will operate large-scale experimental facilities and also computational facilities. They are, that's what sort of distinguishes us from universities. We have much larger. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Otherwise, I'll have to talk more directly into the microphone. Um, so our uh, remit is to do fundamental research, and we take it sort of two things to the prototype stage, and then we would hand it off to, to industry. Um, our key challenge is, as I said, experimental. we have experimental facilities, and with all technologies, as you see today, experimental facilities also become much more data intensive, and I'll be talking about this in detail. One of the, the key challenges for us is that um, the, the data rate is growing exponentially. And uh, with the experiments, we are going from, uh, we're having a paradigm shift. In the past, we would collect data, people would take it home, it's sort of in the megabyte to, to gigabyte range, they take it home and analyze it. What we have today is that we, we have data streams in the gigabytes to terabyte a second range and people can't take it home, and they want to do real-time steering of experiments. Now, where's the big challenge? A, there's a data challenge generally, but most of our scientists are used to write their software in Python and um, at small scale. What we now need is tools to enable them to, to still use Python wherever possible, but do it at scale. And so this is where we're looking to this community for solutions to say, well, how can we do this? How can we enable scientists that are not necessarily extremely computer savvy to use the same tools as before, but produce much more scalable solutions? And now I'm going to talk about what sort of some of our challenges look like. As I said, um, the national uh, laboratories operate a whole range of facilities, in, in 27 in total. Uh, six of those are actually ap operated at Brookhaven National Lab, which is the largest number of all of them. And they span a whole range of different things. So there, there's a relativistic heavy ion collider. Um, if you don't take anything back from that, it's nuclear physics. Um, we're looking at the start of the universe, what, what materials look like at that time within <laughs> that experiment. We have the National Synchrotron Light Source, uh, this is the newest and brightest uh, synchrotron in the world. It's a tool that enables you to probe materials and observe physical, chemical, and biological processes as they are happening. You're making films of ha things that are they're evolving. We have the Center for Functional Nanomaterials, where we are looking at um, materials in detail, how they are building up, how you grow your, your materials, how you build them, uh, how faults might develop or not, hopefully. Uh, we have an accelerator test facility. Uh, accelerators is something that we use for many of our experiments. Uh, most of you will have heard of the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. We're obviously not operating that particular experiment, but we're doing the computing, or a large part of the computing for that experiment at Brookhaven National Lab. We're actually the largest data center outside of CERN within that collaboration. Um, we are also involved in atmospheric radiation measurement. This is not really radiation. This is measuring the sky, the atmosphere, looking how that's developing in support of climate research. In addition to those uh, national user facilities, 
We are also involved in two more activities, the Bell 2 experiment, which is a uh, neutrino experiment. Uh, at CERN, it's about a quarter of the size of the, the Large Hadron Collider, but again, very large, large data volumes. And then quantum chromodynamics, which is a, a theory program that, that supports nuclear physics, and they ha need large computing facilities. So what you can see from all of those is that the science that we do is data-driven. And so the, the computer science that we do at Brookhaven National Lab is all focused at supporting these kind of experiments to develop the tools, the fundamental principles that we can do the analysis in the form that they needed at the, at the scale that they needed. What does that mean? So uh, in 2017, we reached a milestone. Um, we are currently archiving 100 to, uh, just over 100 petabytes of data. Um, that makes us the second largest scientific data archive in the US and the fourth largest worldwide uh, behind the ECMWF, the UK Met Office, and NOAA. Um, we store a lot of data, we process even more. So in 2016, we processed 400 petabytes of data. This year, we expect to reach 500 petabytes. That gives you sort of a, a little scale. Um, some of our experiments that we're looking at, so they, they go from a single experiment might produce 10 to 20 tera terabytes of data to 10 petabytes for a single experiment that runs a few days. So that's sort of the, the rough scale that we're working with. Um, a lot of the data is processed and kept on site. Others is shipped out and, and to others. We, we take in and give out about 40 uh, petabytes a year that we ship across the world. Um, we have some, some software that allows us to process not just data on site but also off site, uh, which is called Panda. Uh, and in 2016, Panda enabled the, the analysis of by 1.6 exabyte of data. That's just for one of our experiments, just sort of as a background. So where do we need and why do we need real-time analysis and decision making? Well, we need, to need uh, streaming decision making or support basically when data arrives at a velocity, at high velocity and volume basically at a velocity and volume that a human can't look at it any longer uh, and make meaningful decisions. Um, the second thing is that critical decisions have to be taken. If the data just comes and I don't really care about it, you can still collect it and do it afterwards. But in this case, we don't. Um, one of the key things that we have in science is that the events of interest are, are rare. It's, we are not interested in things that you've seen before. That happens all the time. They're nice. We collect them, statistics, great. But what we're interested in are the things that are unusual, that are rare, where you think, well, is this just a flaw in my experiment, or is this something new? Is it a new discovery? And at that point, I really want to go deep, and I want to be able to say, no, this isn't a flaw. This is something really cool and new, and I want to establish as many facts as possible. Um, and it takes, as with many things that, that require intuition and discovery, it takes a lot of tacit knowledge in the, the user of the experiments to, to interpret it at the point in time. You want to give it, them as much help as possible, but you really require their input at that moment in time. It's a very personal thing. So what does streaming analysis include in, in, in terms of experimental uh, control? So we analyze the facts of the situation, what, what's really happening. And what we want to see is not, oh, this just happened. We want to see, we think this is going to happen. So we want to catch any phenomena as it's evolving so that we can go deeper. Um, and that's, that's sort of the, the key thing. It's a rare event. We want to catch it as early as possible, because when it's over, we can't do anything any longer. We can't go back in an experiment. Um, we also need to consider background information. This is the thing where I say, well, is this something new, or have I seen it a thousand times, and therefore, yeah, I can let it go. Um, and we want to be able to uh, request more information at that moment in time if I think it's something interesting. And I want to be able to consider alternatives. So um, if you have a complex 
biological system, there might be many things going on at the same time. The question is, which one do I want to focus on? I might not be able to, to capture all of them. And if I focus in this area, I might not see something else. So I have to, to look at what are my alternatives. What do, what do I might miss so that I can make a decision? And then I basically have to set priorities and, and change my experiment the phys physically as I'm going on. So this is sort of the, the background to this. So our first example is, is one of the smaller scale ones. Um, this is a transmission electron microscope. Um, I'm not going to expect that any of you know what it is. But it basically is a tool that allows us to probe materials. You have very thin slices and you can look at the materials. Um, you can interact, it interacts with the specimen, the specimen changes. One of the challenges um, with this technique is that it's damaging. It's very good to, to, to uh, figure out the structure, but it damages your material as you're investigating it. So you have to be quick to get to the point that you want. Um, but it might take a while for your uh, reaction to happen to capture that. So you, you have to have a fi fine balance between taking sort of snapshots where you radiate the, to some extent, the, the material and damage it to the point where something is really happening and then you really want to, to get all the images that you, you get, want to have in great detail. So that's sort of the challenge here. It's a growing method. Um, there's about 500 of those instruments worldwide, 20 to 30 of those in national laboratories. And like everything else, um, the technology is rapidly evolving. Um, we were, um, not very many years back, you would capture something like maybe 100 images a, an hour. So, so you really had the time, you collect an image, you can look at it and say, oh, that looks nice or not. And um, now we, we have um, newer, newer uh, tools or instruments like, like the one at Brookhaven that collects 400 images a second. So even if I could show this to you, there's absolutely no way you could see anything. Um, another challenge that we had, so I'll, I'll show some of the, the type of data that you get. Um, so the preferred method to analyze this data in detail was called a postdoc, who would sit there and look at it and say, that looks interesting, and no, that's not right, and yes, this is the sort of the statistics behind it. Um, clearly, at 400 images a second, um, we can't hire enough postdocs that, to do that work, nor would they want to do it because it's really boring. So we obviously need computational approaches for it. Um, so here the challenge is 400 images a second, that's about three gigabits, gigabytes a second in, in data volume, and you want to do real-time analysis on it so that you can steer the experiment. So. Um, this is what you see there is, is sort of the type of data that you get. Um, those are particles that are moving in the material. As you can see, it's, it's um, quite, quite a noisy background. This is actually a relatively clear example, to be honest. Um, and with this, so you want to identify the particles. You want to see how they evolve. Some of them will be merging. Some of them will be going apart again. <coughs> And you want to get statistics on how big they are. So for that, we developed a, a convolutional neural network based approach to analyze those images and filter out what, what's in it. And this is sort of the second picture. So you can see that here on the, on the right, the image uh, which, where we've basically um, identified the, the, the particles, and we at the same time, we are uh, collecting the size and the statistics of the sizes and the size distribution. So this is uh, one of those types of analysis. There's many different experiments that you can do with this, but this is one of the uh, key type of experiments that are done with it. Uh, this now allows the scientists to see uh, <coughs> as an collect those statistics as it's going on. The next step is then to identify areas of interest within this where they might want to go deeper, where, they ha where you highlight that as it's going on. This is sort of the next step that we're looking for. Oops. 
Oops, that's one too far. So another type of um, electron microscope is, is a cryo-EM. This is one of the things that we are looking forward to. That gets even more difficult, as you can see. Um, this is for biological uh, experiments in particular. Um, it's used also in healthcare. Um, so anything on, on, on the biological side, cancer research, um, they are particularly keen on that. It's mainly for biological samples. As you can see, the contrast is abysmal. Uh, you get the same data rates as before, but you, as you can see, it, it, basically you can't see. <laughs> it's very difficult, and you still want to do the same kind of uh, detection mechanisms on it, and so we're looking for, for methods for that. Um, and we've, we've used the same algorithm as before with some improvements, could retrain it, and so that, that was a very nice success. Uh, still identify not maybe everything, but, but a large part of the proteins that are in the sample. And, and here's some, some examples of the, um, the different types of um, networks and algorithms that we used, different types of training. So this is one of the challenges um, with uh, any kind of machine learning algorithm. The training, is, uh, the training data is really, really important. You can see this here. The performance of those algorithms really varies. And one of the research areas, I'm not going to talk in too much detail here, but one of our research areas is to develop more robust machine learning algorithms that are not so dependent in their quality of output on the training data um, so that we can enable more scientists or users generally that, that have less experience in it to, to produce results that, that, that are, they can rely on. So the second example that I want to talk about is, is our uh, synchrotron light source. I mentioned that before. Um, I brought up a couple of pictures here just to, to give you some, some background on what that looks like. So um, synchrotrons have uh, gone through, through different phases, but the, the current generation looked like a donut. Uh, as you can see there, there, there's a few around the world, but not too many. Um, it's basically a ring which accelerates uh, protons or, or electrons, and then you have um, sort of what we call beam lines going off. Uh, and at the end of each of them is, is what, what's a, uh, basically an instrument to, to investigate materials of, of various kinds and different sizes. Um, a synchrotron like this one in full build out will have 60 different uh, beam lines. Uh, each beam line can be configured in different ways. So say factor of two basically. Um, that makes 120 different instruments, which produce different types of data, need different kinds of treatment. Um, an experiment lasts maybe eight hours, something like that, sometimes longer. Each experiment will be different, a different community. It can be material scientists, that can, next time it will be a biologist. And then you have someone who looks at catalysis or, or, or anything else ke chemical. So, um, in designing those analysis algorithms, you have to be very, very careful. On the other hand, we also have to scale. We can't develop a different analysis algorithm for every user. So what we're looking for are building blocks that work for, for many of them, and then we customize it to a specific uh, scientific area. And for example, machine learning works very well in this, this area, but, but other techniques work too. But this is sort of the, the kind of challenges that, that we have. Um, what you also see here is, is sort of the, the scale change that we have. So this light source, we also had a previous generation on site, which is actually my new home. Uh, we've, we've converted that into to our computing center, the old light source. Um, but this new one is 10,000 times brighter than the old one. Brightness usually goes with data rate. That sort of gives you a feeling. So you have users who are really used to, to megabytes of data going to terabytes a second. And that's a huge, huge challenge. Um, I want to focus in my examples on two particular beam lines because they, they sort of, one, one is sort of our training 
uh, beamline because they have it has a uh, smaller data um, data rate um, with four four and a half gigabytes a second, so we can train a lot of uh, our tools on it. But the the one that we are really aiming to to um, what, which, which is challenging us is the the HXN beamline, which will have 50 gigabytes a second sustained uh, data rate and will produce one to five terabytes a second in burst. And that's sort of interesting just from a pure hardware perspective to get this off the instrument and then from, from a processing perspective. Um, one of the things that I would also like to mention, because um, in the past we've actually done quite a lot of work also with commercial frameworks for stream processing, um, one of the challenges we've found is that the data that we have is highly correlated. So those are not independent events. So if you have a, um, many of the frameworks like, um, like Kafka, for example, is purely based, their performance is based on independence of events. If you try to, to actually bring order into that and, and correlate events, the, the performance collapses at this point. So, so it's a very different challenge in that, that aspect. Because um, as I said, what we want to do, so what we want to do is to, to, to identify emerging phenomena. So, so the ordering of your events and the, the relationship to each other is quite important in the analysis. What we want to do on those beamlines is um, observing and controlling uh, physical, chemical, and biological processes. Uh, that means that we work on very short time scales, um, that we have to process this data and give feedback so that it's still meaningful, that, you can, that the user can still react to it. Um, and what we do is, so in situ, which means something happens, but we also uh, do larger scale experiments in operando. What we can do is take um, whole things like batteries, for example, and observe them as they are working and looking at how everything is happening inside them, how the chemical processes are working, uh, how they can be improved, how they can be steered. So that's, that's highly exciting. Um, Microchips is another one. So we've worked for, for a very long time, for example, with IBM uh, and other companies who come to the, to the synchrotron and test their latest and greatest uh, equipment and materials with us to see if they perform in the way that they expect. So what have we done so far? Um, one of the things is that experiments are not perfect which is, um, you've seen there already from the previous image that, that we, what we create is often quite noisy uh, because we're sort of at the, really at the edge of what you can detect. Um, and then in addition to that, we have our, get artifacts in our images that we don't want to have and that don't help us in, in, the, um, in the analysis afterwards. So we've developed um, methods that help us to heal images. And what we do there is, is sort of take uh, classical machine learning, but we integrate that with, with key physical knowledge um, so that we can, can um, heal and fill it, this in with the knowledge of what should, should be there. And so you can see some of those healed images here. Uh, we do that in a streaming fashion, and that then goes into the analysis pipeline. Um, after that, we then uh, again use machine learning, deep learning approach to identify um, different artifacts in, in the images. And what we've done here is, is really to, to look at the key uh, artifacts that we want to, would want to see or would, would be interested in seeing or expecting to see. Um, that takes a physical knowledge of the experiment, but it doesn't of the experimental setup, but not necessarily of the material that you are investigating. That's sort of the next step. Then to say, so I'm seeing this, what does this mean for the experiment? So this is finding out what's the meaning, starting with an interpretation. For that, you have to, again, bring the physical or biolog biological knowledge in to help with that interpretation. <coughs> As I said, so we're, we're producing data at very, very high rates. 
um, even if I can do the interpretation that I've just showed, it still doesn't mean I have something that I can show to a user that they can actually use to make a decision. As I said, if I show you 400 images a second or more, this is, this, this is actually more, this goes into the thousands of images a second, uh, you can't make a decision. I have to guide, guide the user to a point where they can say, here's something important. And that's, that's what we use for that is visual analytics, uh, which really um, uses guidance from the user to say what's important to me in this particular experiment, plus some background information on what people usually tend to find interesting, um, to, to prioritize that and show that to the user highlighted um, in different ways and forms and, and showing the data in different ways so that they can zoom in themselves and say, well, this looks interesting or this is different from what I expected. And so um, we, we have quite a number of interfaces for that that help the user to explore that, um, looking at different ways of how we can, can show this kind of, of multidimensional data uh, in a new way that, that enables that interaction and then the decision making. Um, what I have now is just a few uh, examples of things that we've done uh, on other experiments, but, but sort of that go in the same, same direction. Um, this is a, a recent uh, publication and, uh, um, where we basically worked, uh, used machine learning to uh, interpret the structure of nanoparticles from the experiment that was never done before. Uh, that, that's usually work that takes months. You, you get, get some uh, images out. You then have to decipher them and see what, what it actually means. Uh, with, a new, with a machine learning approach, we were able to interpret them as the data is collected, giving the user much more um, input and, uh, it, to help them to, to interpret and steer their experiment. Um, another thing that we've done, this is uh, also a Python-based um, approach. So for many of the things that we look at, um, we don't just look at one experiment, but you need computational studies, you need different types of experiments to really explore a material and all its properties that it has, not just the structure, the properties, properties under different conditions. So. When you then come to interpret it, the, the problem is that all the data is quite, quite different. And so you have to create an environment where it makes, that makes it easy for people to integrate the data and pull out the key results and, and information out of the different experiments and put them into one place so that they can interpret that and, and learn what they need to. Um, our computational modeling infrastructure does that. Uh, in the past, this used to be what we call hero efforts because it takes a long, long time to get all of this done and everyone had a one-off approach. This here is an um, automated approach that makes it easy to take ex the results from different experiments and integrate them. Um, the software is, is freely available and is, is heavily in use and has been used on many, many different studies. And um, this just um, highlights a, a recent paper in Nature Communications, for example, for some discovery that was enabled with that kind of tool that couldn't have been done otherwise. Um, this one I've just brought up to, to again, uh, reinforce what I said at the start. Um, we, we have tools today that, that worked for similar methods on the old synchrotron, and, and they worked fine on their, those data rates. The challenge is how do we take those Python codes and bring them to the scale that, that we need? And so we've done quite a bit of work in, in studying different Python frameworks to, to see how we can par paralyze the code, what do we need to change maybe in the background, what are the trade-offs between different approaches? And so um, that, that has been very, very interesting. Um, we haven't found so far quite the approach that we like that gets us to the scale that we would want. So we're, we're looking for, for input uh, from anyone who, who has ideas to, to push this quite a bit further than, than where we are today. Um, but we're, we're very open and we're, we would be happy to collaborate with anyone who has ideas. And we have challenges for you if you have tools and solutions. 
So then I just wanted to, to close off with um, talking a little bit about who we are. Um, so um, Dan mentioned uh, I'm leading the computational science initiative that is basically um, all research computing, um, computer science research, applied math research is, is uh, directed by me at the laboratory. Um, what we've done is to pull experts from many different departments together um, in, in under one umbrella. Uh, we reach out a lot to the domain scientists, as you've seen for some of the approaches, it's not just the computer science that can solve it, but we, we need the domain knowledge and integrate that into our solutions as well um, to, to solve our questions. And so this, this broad approach is, is really important to us. And we, we obviously, we do, we are more on the research side, so we also work with all the scientists that do the operational side and the actual deployment of the tools um, very closely together um, to develop new, new approaches um, for, for our, our challenges. <laughs> um, the Computational Designs Initiative has uh, now five departments. Uh, Barbara Chapman is a, uh, leads our Computer Science and Mathematics Division. Um, she is a leading researcher in programming models and compilers. So she leads a whole area that, that is um, not just focused on the algorithms, but anything that goes with it to make your algorithm faster. If you, you're attacking challenges like we do, it's not just the algorithm, it's the underlying computer, computer software, the system software, um, compiler directives, uh, networking, hardware, all of that. So all this is under, uh, uh, directed by her. Um, Eric Lanson leads our scientific data and computing center. So this is the 100 petabyte archive, uh, plus a lot of computing going on, of course. And as it's uh, a data intensive lab, we, we have a quite a varied uh, combination of systems. We have high throughput computing, but we also have high performance computing and various forms. They're um, specialized, obviously, for, for uh, data intensive applications. Um, then we have Shantanu Jha. Uh, he leads the Center for Data Driven Discovery. Uh, Shantanu is a joint appointment with Rutgers University. And um, he, uh, the Center for Data Driven Discovery is sort of our outreach arm, where we apply the tools that we've developed uh, into different domain science areas. And so he, he's on, on that side. Uh, Nick D'Imperio is the computational uh, science uh, laboratory leader. Um, this is more on the uh, classic numerical uh, simulation side, optimizing those kind of courses, uh, those kind of codes. And he, his, he and his team also give a lot of courses. So we're, we'll be organizing another hackathon for a specific um, platform from Intel in, in the summer, for example, those kind of things. And then one of our newest activities is computing for national security. Um, as you can imagine, many of these techniques, in particular when it comes to high throughput and real-time analysis computing, can be used in many different areas, uh, not just in open science. And so um, we will be uh, much more aggressively pushing into that field because we think we have something to offer there. And I wanted to leave you sort of with the key research initiatives that, that we are focused on. Those, those are the things that drive us. And from what you've heard me talk about, you can see probably where they are coming from. Real-time analysis and ultra-high throughput data streams, well, that you've seen that. Um, that's clearly one of our co core focus areas and everything that, that, that is needed for that. Um, one of the things on this list that I wanted to mention, which is pretty cool, I think, is our, uh, one of our newer project, Analysis on the Wire, where we've basically said there is much more data in, in transfer than there is in storage. So could we do something with the data while it's being moved, rather than waiting for it to arrive? And can we develop a framework that allows us to play, place selected analysis on the network and apply it to selected data sets. So, so that's what we're doing there. A second area is autonomous optimal experimental design. So if you think of these experiments that we do, we usually explore a design space. I'm looking for a new material that I to solve a particular problem. 
Um, now, we can't go in and say, well, this is exactly what I want. So we have to try it out. The question is, how can you design those experiments and the pathway through the experiments and their analysis um, to optimize this so that we don't have to do too many experiments and get quicker to the solution? As a background, uh, for example, to develop a new material for, for the aerospace industry takes 20 to 30 years. From, from the initial discovery to actually having a ma new material that's used by the industry. What they would like to do is bring this down to five years. Now, without computational uh, tools, better experiments, better analysis of the data, faster analysis, that wouldn't be possible. And so those are the kind of challenges that we're thinking about. And then the last one, as I mentioned, the experiments that we have produce vast amounts of data. Um, I, I talked about the microchip experiment, where we think that will produce about 1 to 10 petabytes for, for, for one experiment that you need to analyze. Um, we've talked to, to researchers um, of the Brain Initiative, for example, where they said, well, if I, I could today image a mouse brain completely, um, that would produce 60 petabytes of data. I can't possibly analyze that. <laughs> so the question is, and obviously they would want to do more than one mouse brain to get any statistical information out of it. So the question is for us, how can we enable the analysis of those kind of data sets? And you have to remember by that, that at the end of the day, there's a person there. So our cognitive abilities are limited in comparison to a computer. So how do I bring down what's in there to, to a person, enable it to do interactive analysis? I don't want to start something and come back two years later. I want to be able to play around, try out things. How can I enable that? That will need new computer systems, new hardware, new system software, new algorithms. And so that's the kind of thing that we are looking for. And with that, I'm leave you and say thank you. And if you have any questions. Yep. It, well, it, it depends on what kind of science you want to do, <laughs> really. Um, so the, I think the, in many universities are actually involved in those experiments. This, we, we, we run the facility, but the users are, of all those facilities are largely in universities. Um, so what this is is basically a bridge for you. What we are trying to do is to help university scientists to, to work with those experiments and to analyze it. Um, if you're in those fields, you will have those data challenges. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>